<laughs> yeah, I don't know if encouragement's the word. We have plenty of that. <laughs> we may need the support. Appreciation. Appreciation. <laughs> we have lots of forcing functions on this issue, like a hard stop. Yeah, it, again, my name is Jim Simak, and uh, I have the privilege of being a part of a team of people here at Lucent, especially within the, the AMPS PCS business unit, who have been hard at work about a year now in a more formal sense, worrying about the issue of, of year 2000 and how will we manage all that. Uh, it happens to be about a year anniversary for us formalizing the team that's addressing Y2K. There were some folks uh, who, through their own thoughtful processes, at least six months prior to that, roughly the latter part of 1996, started thinking about and worrying about some of that code that sits here and there and, and will it, in fact, impact anything as we move into the year 2000 and the recogni recognition of the millennium versus 1900. What I plan on doing today is going through at a, a relatively high level a lot of material and, and some of it you don't have to have too much of a concern about. It's, it really is an expression of kind of where this project has gone, what our focus has been. It gives a current status of where we are with our plans and progress. I have a little upfront about an industry perspective on Y2K since it's such a per pervasive topic. I mean, you cannot help pick up a newspaper, pick up a book, and somebody is talking, saying, or writing about Y2K. So what's up? Uh, most of you at this point, I'm quite sure, know what's up. And it's the, the problem that may exist where uh, software is not exactly able to translate or recognize the year 2000, but rather plays back the tune saying it's 1900. Uh, what are we doing about it? Whoops, thank you. Well, actually, uh, what are we doing about it? This is intended to be somewhat humorous, but if, if you really look at a lot of what's more publicly visible, it appears as though it's an industry. Uh, there are people worrying about millennium parties. There are people worrying about uh, baubles and bangles and trinkets. There's a huge, huge market for millennium kinds of products, aside from really addressing the problem itself. But comical, but nevertheless, it, it's a growth industry on top of being a, a pretty, pretty severe problem for many, many industries. Uh, Again, that tended to be somewhat humorous, but very serious note here. Uh, fact of life is for some of these reasons, actually. Uh, companies are still in denial. And I have some data later that kind of expresses where the industry is. And, and by the way, the data is subject to change. It depends on what newspaper you pick up. Everyone is doing some form of research on Y2K and trying to assess how, how the industry seems to be addressing or not addressing the issue. Uh, so for some rather comical reasons, there are still actually many companies in denial still saying, hey, I'm, I'm got a successful business today. This is where my focus is. Why should I have to worry about year 2000? It's not going to bother me. It's not, that's not true. And the government's starting to worry about that fairly severely. The industry perspective, and again, the numbers are in the eyes of the beholder. You can find any researcher who probably has their own sets of data. But it's a, it's a sizable financial burden for a lot of companies. And, and worldwide, it's somewhere between 600 and $800 billion, depending on the data that you happen to read. Uh, as you can see, the real concern is in the small and mid-sized companies. And, and they play a, a key role, in the, so to speak, in the critical path of a, large, a lot of larger industries like the Fortune 500. Just like Lucent, we are dependent on a number of smaller businesses who supply to us components, sub-assemblies and a lot of other things that, that we integrate or embed in our, in our overall product solutions. Uh, we are right now many times uh, leveraging those companies to step up and make sure that what they bring to our doorstep is in fact compliant. But there is a, there is a, a, a real severe concern about those small to medium-sized businesses just ignoring the issue. We have a formal process in place through our our organizations within Lucent that worries about supplier contracts. And again, we have built in to our, our contracts mandates that say they come to our door with compliance. And those compliance are based on standards that we have defined as well as the industry in terms of Y2K compliance. Some are very late. You know, only a third of these folks have started any, any kind of focus on Y2K and very late, quite frankly. And admittedly, we were somewhat late. As I say, we had some, some really concerned people kind of in the trenches 
worrying about this well before we engaged a formal team, but we were late getting a formal team anointed. And, and we could put ourselves in that same position of somewhat of in denial. Our, ours wasn't so much in, in denial as it was other priorities, and that's an easy thing to kind of keep you not attending to the real issue. And that's, we're very busy folks. Everyone's engaged in producing products which are making lots of money for Lucent. I don't have time for Y2K. So we became anointed officially more with executive <coughs> recognition back in the, the June time frame of 1997. I'll talk more about that later. Impacts in, in these key markets, utilities, stay out of elevators. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's just inconceivable what, what might happen. Uh, power, I mean, things like, like mission critical applications that are dependent on some form of computer backup. There may, may be implications. Transportation systems, you've seen articles already that says don't fly on or about the year 2000. The air traffic controlling systems may be impacted, who knows? Retail in terms of the supply system, again, you've got distribution systems, you've got inventory systems, you may find that the things you want to buy aren't there because of, of breakdowns in the systems. Government, uh, everyone's concerned about governments. Uh, they, they received recently kind of a failing report based on an audit that was done. Several agencies are well behind in, in any compliance, but overall they're claiming that 40% of all the federal agencies are in, in relatively good shape. That's enough on the, on the industry perspective piece. The real mission at hand is to, uh, is to eliminate the century risk where it may exist, and it doesn't exist in every case. Preserve current operations. We've all completely turned the world over in, in the sense of a forklift upgrade, as we sometimes call it, when we replace a product. We want to preserve and protect as much of those operations and keep them running as they are and minimize that, that, that uh, burden on our customers and, and this also plays in the minimization of the conversion process. We, we don't want to have to, to cause our, our customers to have to do a lot that upsets their daily operations. Um, the timeline, and this is more Lucent specific, to give you some perspective again of, of when we more formalize things and, and how things are progressing. We were heavily wireline driven. It was really network systems proper that stepped up to the uh, the mission, basically driven by a consortium of our old RBOX that decided, ugh, Y2K is pretty serious stuff. We better kind of form a consortium between all the RBOX and start banging on our suppliers. And they did this back in the, between March and June of 1997. Uh, it's called the, the Telco Forum. We started hearing back from the Telco Forum, from the wireline side, that some things were going on, that, that on the wireline side, our, our customers were heavily driving us to do certain things in certain ways, asking us very relevant questions about what are you, Lucent, doing about your problem or potential problem. So we engaged a team back in June of 97, and I'll talk more about what we engaged them to do. Our customers back uh, in the early part of 97 were asking us really for, for compliance no later than March of 98. What they were asking Lucent at that time was, you must have available for me compliant releases of your products no later than March 98. Our corporate position at that time was, uh, we understand best case given all the things we have to do to ready that. Uh, our commitment to our customers was compliance no later than September 98, which is still the plan of record. Everything looks like, like we're beating the drums to that tune and we should meet that, that commitment. So, from a corporate perspective, the party line is, if you ever talk to a customer, uh, we will deliver, make available compliance, all of our products, Lucent products, across Lucent, corporate-wide, compliant releases by no later than September 98. I'll talk about a few exceptions in that case. We kicked off this team. I'll explain what they were engaged to do. Uh, we also, at this time, as many companies do, engaged a, a corporate program planning group. This is a, an overseer group of program planning experts, some like, much like the, the aerospace industry uses when, when you've got a large, complex project to manage with a lot of interdependencies. So we, we formed a corporate team. They were a little slow in coming on the scene. Uh, they were transitioned off other programs and projects that had declined in importance. So we started working with them back in roughly the August time frame. All these little releases out here, I'll explain a little bit later, but it's, it's primarily the interdependencies we have with 5e and our plans to roll out compliance in ECPs 11, 12, and 10. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. 
And game, of course, is the main event here, uh, clocking in at year 2000, which we're all kind of uh, <coughs> waiting for and wish we could emulate somehow. Getting started was the biggest challenge we had because it was a, it's, it's a once, unless you're really lucky and you, and, you, and you do your dieting and do your exercise and all these other things, it's going to be a once in a lifetime event for most of us in this room and I <laughs> applaud those of you who have <laughs> taken the challenge to make that not be the case. But it's a once in a lifetime event and, it, and, and the event itself is, is so, so complex and spans so many elements from our business. So from that perspective, it was very atypical for us when we engaged in terms of a project scope. The project scope was, you name it. We, we started off with the development focus as we typically do. You know, there's code to be looked at. We need to then take remedial action on code that seems to be impacted, map that in, system test, blah, and so on and so forth. But there's a whole array of other interdependencies that we had to have regard for. And our, our team was not sanctioned for just development and test. We were responsible for the AMPS PCS BLG overall program. So we had to worry about supplier commitments, customer contracts, manufacturing, are there test sets down in the factory somewhere in Oklahoma City and Columbus that could have breakage that could stock a, stop a complete production line come year 2000. So a lot of different facets to, to the program, which typically in, in from day to day here, we don't have to think about too much. So it's a, lar it's, it's a large complex project that needed careful orchestration. Uh, we were somewhat in catch-up mode in that, as I say, the rest of the corporation on the war line side kind of got the jump on us. The other piece of it was deployment. Now, we're pretty good at deployment, but usually it's, it's uh, kind of load leveled in the sense that customers reserve when they want to move to particular generics or software updates. In this case, because of the hard stop, meaning we, don't, we can't slip schedule beyond year 2000, we've got to deliver the goods well before that. We expect that a lot of our, all of our customers would, would retrofit or move to compliant releases in a very short time frame. So we took that under advisement. The CTS organization right now is in a fairly good position to support those plans. And I'll talk more about that in the deployment section of this talk. Just a brief comment. I mentioned that, that because of the complexity of the project and the need to have a loosened focus. We need to appear like one corporation to all of our customers, indifferent to wireline wireless. They put the program office people into place. Uh, the concern was consistent, ongoing communication. We didn't want various stories being told to various customers that were in conflict. So what pro the program office has helped us to do is, is be the overseer from a corporate perspective bring legal counsel in from a corporate perspective. Uh, they have also uh, identified interfaces into all of our customers in a consistent manner. We do a lot of the, the feeding of those interfaces in terms of information, but, but again, they, they tend to be the, the conveyor of information to our customers through the customer team such that we always have one party line, we're all on the same sheet of paper, and, and there's no issues of inconsistency in information or timeliness. Uh, we're doing business plans. If you may have read some of the news recently, uh, because of the government's concern with some of these small and medium-sized companies not, not being as swift as they should in addressing the issue, uh, they are trying to audit uh, most, most industries in terms of their progress toward addressing Y2K. One way they're auditing us is by asking us how much money are you spending, have you spent, and will you spend to remedy this problem. So far from the first audit that the Securities Exchange Commission took in the last month or two, they got very, very sketchy data which worries the feds big time. So you may see a little more force from the feds uh, mandating that, that companies step up and, and prove to them that we have programs in place and we're addressing this problem. So, so that will help us. They say we have some leverage through supplier contracts and things, but we may need some help in some cases where we see someone not, uh, not exactly doing what they should when they, sh when they should do it. Data management, maybe data is the wrong, the wrong word, uh, information management. Again, I kind of talked about consistency of information. Uh, again, sp kind of spawned by the, the telco forum and, and many of the wireline customers driving a lot of the requirements into this business. Uh, they, through a third-party contract, had put under contract Belcor, our old buddies. And Belcor right now is acting as an auditing unit 
to help them kind of provide consultation and place requirements on all, all, all suppliers for the carriers. Belcor has come up with a Y2K standard specification. Uh, that specification came into us a few months ago. We had to address a litany of questions. It was a standard that kind of said that it, it's, it basically defined the framework such that all suppliers, whether it be Nortel, Tandem, or whoever, when you come to the door with your Y2K stuff, there's some consistency and some plug and play to the way we've implemented the compliance. So that's the, that's the net out of the Belcor specification. But that drove a lot of how we were going to implement Y2K compliance. We needed also to inventory our products and provide that to our customers. What's your grocery list of all the AMPS PCS product elements? Are there plans or are they compliant? Are they not compliant? For those that are not compliant, do you have plans to make them compliant and when will they be compliant? Uh, for some products, we found that they were simply not date sensitive. There was no Y2K impact. Again, we needed to identify those products and substantiate through approvals through R&D here, a sign off letter that we have reviewed this interface or this particular product element and we're declaring it as non-Y2K impacted. They also want impact statements. These are very, very good things to ask. If I were a customer, I'd be asking the same things. Impact statement applies to if for some reason I choose not to be compliant, what happens to me? What happens to my network? So again, we had to delineate uh, if for some reason you choose not to move to a compliant generic release or update what will my system experience? And that was done by Gary McCoy and some of the team in the R&D community. Bottom line is, and I'll show a chart on that, didn't find too much that got, would, should worry anyone quite. Operationally, the system stayed up. Billing records were generated as expected. Just some minor noise that was developed here and there, but I'll talk more about that in a minute. They want our test plan, something that they can review before we actually go into GA of our of our Y2K release. They also want test results of any internal testing we've been doing, and I'll, I'll talk more about that testing progress. So some, uh, some strong mandates for information, but you can't fault them. They're asking the right questions, and we would too. On the testing side, you know, for the fact being that we have not changed any, any, uh, any of the interfaces, either in timing or protocol, it simplifies life a great deal. Uh, we can manage both two and di four digit formats without too much of a problem. I won't go into this, it talks a lot about, again, the, the testing prerequisites, both, both pre-general availability and post-general uh, general availability. It includes testing, and I'll explain later, uh, later. Uh, it includes testing of lucent to lucent interfaces, which we typically don't do in the environments we have within our lab facilities. An interface, a lucent to lucent interface might be uh, Autoplex to communication software products, that interface. They want those physically tested, and we're engaged in doing that kind of stuff. A couple of our customers by contract have asked us to t test Lucent to non-Lucent product, where they've got in their environments, they've got some other vendors' products which they'd like us to, to, to interrupt, t interrupt test with. Uh, we as a corporation have not stepped up to do that, that Lucent to non-Lucent interface interrupt testing. <coughs> but we may get caught up in contracts, we don't know yet. Compliance approach is, again, basically we're guaranteeing our customers that as they move into year 2000, everything is hunky-dory. Uh, we're able to process both two and four digit date formats, uh, maintain, maintaining their existing applications, so on and so forth. Basically a seamless move into the year 2000 without any hiccups. Uh, plan of record availability for our compliant releases is ECP-12 which is our first generic to roll with compliant code resident in it, kind of benign to the release itself. That goes out 7-10-98. Uh, there was a prospect of some movement, and the GA date for ECP-12 as it happens, we've held schedule, which is good news, and, and we're on track with that. Again, none of the FOA, the first office application testing activity at that time, will test any Y2K rollover. It, it is just a typical FOA test for ECP-12. And I say that the only thing that will be found is that that code that's in there, the remedial code that we've developed to, to, to correct any impacts that we found uh, is just benign. That's the, that's the best outcome of that test. We know that for a fact today by, by testing done in system test as well. But it will not roll over the clock, which is the real life test of Y2K. Uh, we'll also reverse map back to uh, two other generics, 11 and 10. SU-98 
0707. It's coincident that they're named the same, but they're two distinct dates, but we'll be mapping back compliance into those two generics. Reason being, uh, a lot of international customers are, are still sitting back on relatively uh, early releases. It would be humanly impossible, and I tried it at AMOG one year and got my kneecaps chopped off, humanly impossible to force everyone onto a specific generic at a point in time. It's just the, the deployment behind that is it would, it's just too much runway. It would, it would consume us resource-wise to attempt to push everyone to a generic at one point in time. So again, we did that, and I think things are going well. There's some recent issues with mapping into those two SUs, but hopefully we missed a couple of MRs. Oh, sorry about that. You're right. You're right. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. Exactly. The important point is we're not charging our customers for compliance. Uh, the assumption is most of our customers are on an annual maintenance agreement fee. And under that agreement fee, they get generics throughout the year and software updates at a no, a no additional charge. The compliant code will be in 12 as well as the two SUs. If you're on our maintenance agreement, you're going to get it. Some customers, you know, contracts prevail. Some customers, especially international, have co contracts cut that in many cases still guarantees them that, that even though they're not under maintenance agreement, that, that free release. So again, we're doing contract reviews as we speak. Stepping back to, again, the, the, the engagement of our R&D community finally to get in, involved and, and start looking at where problems might lie. Uh, John Marion kind of angel this thing, Alex Polony at the helm, uh, actually Thayer Johnson in between there, but the core team was sanctioned, about uh, 10 members. We, we put them in place for roughly a period of about three months. Looked over somewhere between two and three million lines of code, you name it. Discovered uh, about 80 to 90 areas that we sensed might be impacted. Uh, basically developed some code to correct any, any problems that appeared, code mapped into our generic and now back into the, the two SUs, and there we have it. And I'll show you the impact statement momentarily. Uh, so that core team was, for the most part, disbanded. Uh, we still hold yet another core team uh, kind of responsible for anything that occurs from that point going forward. And our plan is to keep people in place. Uh, I think we, we have plans for a staff of about six people uh, effective technical headcount uh, well through mid year 2000. The fear we have is that, you know, it's not going to be overcome year 2000. We'll find that, that simply by our customers taking all of our nice, clean compliance stuff and, and doing their network integration, they will find that by tying a lot of other products they have in their networks to our, our switch will cause problems. And you know that they'll rely on us to be a single point of contact for whatever problems arise. So we'll get caught up in in deciphering why that tandem box or why the XYZ box has caused some headaches. So we want to keep some exp expertise around at least for another half year beyond that just to, to kind of be available and, and, to, and to help our customers kind of work through some of these issues that may not have been uh, ours at fault, so to speak. Getting back to the, the complexity of the program, so we had anointed this R&D team. They were hands on, on, all hands on deck in terms of reviewing code, so on and so forth. The rest of us engaged in, in basically a cross-functional team approach. Su Lin has been project managing that cross-functional team since I think our first meeting was in July, roughly, shortly after the uh, August 15th, excuse me. Uh, and again, what we sat back and started thinking about was, well, R&D is just one element of this thing, making sure the code is, is cool. We needed to consider you know, other things like manufacturing, sourcing, the deployment support kinds of issues, documentation and training, sales and marketing. Did we want to share anything with our sales or marketing teams in terms of our progress on the program? One way to, to you know, one, one positive aspect that this program could have for us is, is good PR in terms of a smooth, seamless move of our customers to year th 2000, customer satisfaction kind of focus. So even though we don't make a great deal of money off of this program, it's more of a sunk cost than it is a, a, a money maker for us. There's a lot of customer satisfaction at risk here in, in how we finesse this and make sure that, as I say, our customers are easily moved into the year 2000 without hiccups or any loss of business. 
Uh, contract management was a big one, uh, both with suppliers as well as our customers. We needed to know and understand the terms of those contracts. Do they bind us to doing things a certain way, regardless of if it's Y2K or anything else that we, that we happen to be working on? There's third-party program, the innovations program, which, which uh, for the most part is a program that we refer our customers to for functionality that we choose not to develop within Lucent. Uh, relationships take different forms. One is referral, one is some form of partnership. Uh, for the most part, I think the, the, the current signed up third parties right now are more on a <coughs> referral basis, meaning they're obligated to make their comp the products compliant, but our customers deal directly with them. They don't deal directly through Lucent into them, and Lucent's name does not go on these products as well. But again, we have a, a responsibility to make sure that those products, since we sanction this program, are coming in as compliant. Legal is a big one. Uh, we have a, a corporate team of lawyers as well as our local AMPS PCS team of, of lawyers involved in this. Uh, potentially, you know, it, it could be a very interesting year 2000 for a lot of people in terms of litigation. Uh, so they're kind of guiding us in what to say and what not to say so that we kind of keep ourselves out of out of any, any legal snags we might have in the way we share information with our customers. So they're, again, they're, they're primarily there to provide that guidance. Also, they're there for ongoing counsel. Uh, we have some issues with discontinued product as they relate to certain customer contracts, and I'll go into that in just a wee bit. Financial is mainly, again, I'm working on business cases with our corporate people to at least share with corporate to be sure with the feds, how much money we're spending, so on and so forth on, on the program. There's also some relief for us in terms of uh, being able to write down some of the costs of compliance in terms of a tax write down. So there's some benefit to uh, some of the financials there. PR we're not doing too much on. Uh, it's just there in case, you know, this, sometimes the media comes at us and says, how are you folks doing on Y2K? We've really not been actively engaged in promoting our program and we don't think we should quite frankly, but they're there if we need someone to talk to the press. And then there's of course the y Y2K program office, uh, which is again this gang of corporate people who we interface with on a number of different fronts. Enough on that. Very broad spectrum program, a lot of functional areas to cover and uh, a lot of things to think about. Overall this is a high level milestone uh, chart of our <coughs> plans and progress so to speak. The targets we've talked about, I don't think I have to go too much into this. Field compliance implementation complete by 499. What that means is everything is out there in our customers' hands and they're doing network integration. Uh, the corporate commitment, just for the record, is 699. So we're roughly two months ahead of what the corporation has committed to all of our customers, indifferent to wireline or wireless. And again, right now we have plans in CTSO to support that. Some encumbrances right now, uh, you're only as good as what you know about your customers and where they're headed. And CTSO has been engaged in the last several months in characterizing our customers' environments. We need to know what they're on, what are their plans to move, are they planning to move to 12, or they take an SU, so on and so forth. Uh, we've got 90% of the worldwide uh, customer base characterized for the most part, but there are some outliers internationally or difficult to quantify and manage. We also have some global